Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Today we are going to continue on some of the biotechnology tools which we discussed last class. So outline for today's lecture is, uh, we talked about polymerase chain reaction in last class, we discussed about the gene cloning, we looked at different vector maps. Uh, continuing to that, we'll talk some of the sequencing technologies as well as we'll talk about how to do the protein production uh, and which way many type of gene expression analysis can be performed. So those things we are going to talk in biotechnology tools. Uh, latest field in the uh, overall uh, biology area is moving towards looking at all the biomolecules together. Because now we realize that if you are studying one gene at a time or one protein at a time, probably you are not able to get the right picture of the whole system. So to know a system, for example human system or any of the model organism if you want to uh, study them well probably you need to study that whole system as a whole and therefore you need to know all the biomolecules and their complete properties and that is the kind of field which is known as omics where you are looking at all the gene of an organism like genomics or all the proteins of an organism like proteomics. Something of that kind you have seen in the beginning uh, where scientists are now aiming to look for all the proteins present in a given system which is really much more complex, much more tedious even as compared to what we already know from genomics. So we'll talk very briefly about some of those latest developments in the field. So uh, if I go back in the last lecture, if you remember we were talking about uh, gene cloning, uh, you remember this workflow that we have a plasmid vector and then along with them if we want to fuse a gene of interest, you are making a recombinant DNA molecule and that recombinant DNA molecule because it also contains that vector contains some of the marker genes like antibiotic resistant genes. So you can select the right clone. So after doing the transformation and moving this plasmid in the uh, host, in the bacteria, now you can select the right bacterial colony which is containing the gene of your interest in the plasmid. And then that can be used to further multiply grow to make more copies of that gene as well as if you want to do the protein production you can uh, use some of the expression systems and do the protein expression as well. Let's think one step back, uh, you have studied even PCR, right? So let's say the gene of interest which you want to study, uh, that is present in very low amount. So first of all you can do a polymerase chain reaction to increase the overall uh, DNA component of that. I'm sure you remember the primers which we talked in, in context of polymerase chain reaction, right? The, the short nucleotide sequence which is going to have the complementary uh, sequences to bind uh, to the region of DNA which you want to amplify. Now let's imagine that, uh, think about Morgan's experiments, right? So we were talking about wild type and some of the mutant phenotypes. So if let's say you want to study a gene uh, in its wild type and also you want to see that what will be the change in an organism if I make just one or two small changes in that gene sequence which is the mutant form of that gene. So to do that part, then ideally you are uh, making the changes in the gene sequence itself, right? And to introduce that gene sequence change, you can actually introduce that at the primer designing level itself. When you're designing the primer, you are uh, selecting a, a short nucleotide stretch. In that short nucleotide stretch, if you make some changes uh, in the primer sequence itself, probably that can actually uh, make the changes subsequently in the gene and then followed by in your uh, cloning procedure. So this is a place when people can introduce the changes and you can study the mutant forms of the gene or if you want to study the uh, protein production from it, so you can study both gene uh, or the protein, uh, you can make the changes at the sequence level itself and then rest of the procedure remains the same. So uh, this is uh, I think important slide from uh, many experimental and schematic point of view because it conveys you the process of cloning, it conveys you the process of polymerase chain reaction and it also conveys you 
how can you introduce some changes at the gene sequence level by designing the primers and then use those information to then further amplify the gene segment and then do the further rest of the cloning step in the same manner. This is what we talked in the last class. Let us now move on to see that you know uh, there are many uh, applications of doing the cloning not only that you can make a large amount of DNA uh, but also you can uh, do the protein production and that has huge value for a lot of pharmaceutical products. So, DNA cloning and gene expression systems can also be used for the producing large quantity of a chosen protein. Uh, just, just kind of you know uh, for your curiosity uh, let us imagine that you know how to use uh, this expression systems for the uh, protein production. So, for example, um, we talked about you know you are doing a cloning experiment and you can make multiple copies of that gene right and then you are growing that bacteria and you are multiplying that bacteria you have now uh, multiple copies of that bacteria which is having gene of your interest. So, imagine this particular uh, vector which you had used that was an expression vector which has ability to uh, induce protein production. So, now once you have selected this bacteria on the uh, on the uh, plate here you have this antibiotic resistant plate. So, you know let us say you can use any of the uh, antibiotic resistant gene for selection. So, now you know this is for sure this is the uh, colony of your interest this colony you are uh, further you want to use it for the protein production. Now, at the time of a primer designing level if let us imagine that you had the short nucleotide sequence and in that sequence you had introduced certain uh, nucleotide which correspond to an amino acid histidine. So, what people do people try to use certain tags introduce some tags uh, for the protein purification process. So, let us say if my gene sequence also has certain histidine tags here which I have added at the primer designing level and people use sometimes 6 histidine tag continuously. So, now whatever proteins are going to produce in addition to the protein which is going to come from the native protein structure you are also going to have certain histidine uh, in, in, in addition to that. So, now imagine a, a chromatography technique where you want to purify the proteins and which is one of the affinity chromatography techniques. So, let us say you have these columns and in these columns you have certain raisins which are having nickel NTA. Now, you are uh, having this particular bacterial lysate and that lysate you are passing it in this particular column. This particular column has these raisins which are having nickel on their surface. Now, nickel binds with histidine uh, with the coordination chemistry. So, now all the proteins which are coming here those protein which are having so let us say this is the protein this protein which is having this 6 histidine sequence is going to come and bind to the nickel beads rest everything else is going to just pass and, and get into the flow through. So, all the non specific things can be washed off and then those which are specific your protein of interest you can actually enrich those using affinity chromatography and then you can purify those proteins further for your further analysis. This is one of the ways of doing the uh, protein production. So, conceptually now you, you get it that you know once you have made a clone once you have made multiple copies of the gene of your interest now you can also use that information to do the protein production and there are some very specific chromatography techniques by using them you can actually have the large scale protein production. So, just imagine that you know people who are diabetic who need insulin every day they need every day pure protein right they you cannot uh, you know compromise on the quality of that protein just because somebody needs every day that particular protein. And the large number of diabetic patient whole world who require human insulin every day. So, as many people need different type of human growth hormones millions of people uh, are depending on these kind of treatments. So, you need to produce these proteins in really really large uh, batches in large culture conditions. And that is where chemical engineering and lot of reactors become very handy where the same uh, concept which I talked to you can be done in a small uh, chromatography level can also be done at the very large uh, you know reactor level when you can produce in the several uh, liters or in gallons those kind of cultures you can grow and then from there you can do the protein production. So, they, so you need really really large amount of protein and very high quality and purified protein for various therapeutic requirements. 
Another protein which is tissue plasminogen activator, TPA, uh, this protein is required for people who are having, let's say, heart attack. Immediately after uh, you have these sensations, if this kind of proteins can be injected, it actually helps to uh, dissolve the blood clots. So then patients could be actually saved if this kind of proteins are available. Uh, so therefore, you can just imagine that how useful these proteins are, and you need to produce these proteins in really, really large amount. And that's where many uh, big pharmaceutical companies, they are producing a lot of uh, these kind of proteins which are having uh, large requirements and they need uh, large, uh, you know, the quality control checks as well. So protein production in the plant cell culture system is one of the area in the plant biotechnology and the biotechnology in general, which is kind of very much progressing and a lot of uh, ex examples one could see in that area. Also imagine that, you know, people who are studying different type of drug targets. So let's say you have identified a protein now and you are developing some drug targets or the inhibitors. So you have realized that, you know, for a given cancer patient, for example, there is some change happening in that one given protein. And then if you can block that from some inhibitor, probably you can control that activity. So a lot of co companies, they are developing different drugs. And in this case, if I show you, this is the uh, protein BCR able. Now people have studied that, you know, how it binds with ATP and if it binds with ATP and the substrate binding happens, then that results into the phosphorylation activity, which kind of becomes very detrimental for these individuals. Now, people have exactly identified the same pocket for the binding and uh, an inhibitor, imatinib, has been designed, which can go quickly and block that site. And now once you block that site, therefore the phosphorylation activity will not happen and then the whole of the cascade of the events can be stopped. So just by knowing these molecules properly and knowing that you know where is the, the site where you can do the, the binding or the docking and then you can develop some of the drugs which can mimic that exact binding site that could be very useful and that is an area again lot of pharmaceutical sector is doing lot of work yes so bcr able fusion gene is found in cml leukemia patients it is produced when a segment of Abelson proto-oncogene, ABL, from chromosome 9 translocates to the major breakpoint cluster region or BCR on chromosome 22. So I want to really illustrate not too much about knowing, to, uh, telling you about what BCR able protein does because that is much more uh, difficult and not so much of the right relevance uh, at this context here, but rather that you know how people are using protein production as well as different type of drug molecule production and inhibitors designing which can be so useful for the overall field in general for the uh, medical biotechnology field. Also people are using the concepts of transgenics if you remember. Uh, we said that you know we can make transgenic animals, transgenic uh, organism as well, right? So imagine there is a goat. In that goat, you have just changed one gene, and that gene you are using to synthesize a human blood protein, which could be used for the antithrombin or the uh, clotting factors. So now, uh, goat is doing all the other protein production the way it normally does, but it is also synthesizing one of the protein of human interest. And that particular protein from the goat milk, people are trying to purify that, which can be very helpful. Uh, and that can, if you can, you know, have enough of the milk produced from this goat, and then you can synthesize, you can uh, simply uh, purify this particular protein that could be used for preventing the blood clots. So these are just various examples to illustrate you in which way our understanding at the genome level, at the uh, modern biotechnology tools which we are studying can be so helpful at different levels. So we have been talking about the techniques in isolation. Now, now I'm just trying to illustrating you how some of these techniques have resulted into some of the practical applications which we all need on day-to-day -day basis. Well, let's move on to another exciting uh, area, another exciting technology, which is doing the gene sequencing. So uh, I've been discussing to you that, uh, you know, now we have some idea for all the human genes how many genes we have in human body, which is around 20,300 genes. And uh, there has been some very large sequencing projects in whole world where people were trying to study 
that you know how many genes we have. So first of all, people had curiosity to know that how many human genes we, uh, we have, or for the same matter, different model organisms, how many genes they possess. So uh, you know, we felt that probably as a human, we have of course large number of genes, uh, per, which is much more as compared to what one would assume in the fruit fly or Drosophila, or in the plants like Arabidopsis. So because we are human, we are so superior, we are so intelligent, so probably we have a you know, much larger number of genes which are coding for all of this information. So before starting these projects of sequencing projects, uh, people had kind of you know, different apprehensions and lot of you know, interesting ideas in mind. But in 1990s, lot of major projects started which aimed towards doing the sequencing of the whole organisms. So many projects for the bacterial genome sequencing, or the yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, fruit fly, Drosophila melanogaster, plant, Arabidopsis thaliana, uh, mouse genome, and human genome sequencing. All of these projects were actually uh, started and happening simultaneously in that time. So 1990s and 2002 or 3, that much time was pretty exciting time for all kind of you know, sequencing projects. Intention was to see can we know which are all genes present in a given system. To do that, People have taken uh, the DNA, which we have been talking, cut those DNA into the you know, small fragments, and now you can clone those small fragments, each one of those small pieces, into different vectors. And now each vector you have amplified, and now you can sequence each one of those vectors, what is the you know, ATGC contents of those. And then finally, you can put all of them together in the bioinformatics manner, which will help you to put together the whole sequence of a given organism. Just to convey you the complexity of the project, aim was to do one human genome sequence, only one human. And that took almost 15 years time of 15 plus countries involved and both government fund and private funds were used. And this was kind of one of the, you know, the mega projects in biology, uh, which really aimed first time to see inside what is happening. And that published uh, in the draft human genome, published in 2001. Subsequently, 2002 and 2003, they, they made more uh, progress in that. And then we got some idea that how many genes we have. But you now what was interesting here that we knew that uh, which are all genes we have, but the number of genes were much lower as expected. And the number of genes were pretty much uniform uh, across different organisms. The so numbers are not very heavily different in different model organisms. So that were kind of major findings of the Human Genome Project. Uh, how this was being done, so one of the scientists Frederick Sanger, uh, he developed a method for sequencing DNA, and we are just showing you briefly about it, like how this particular thing was done. So let, just imagine that you know you have double stranded DNA, and now you have separated those. You have denatured the DNA into the single strand. Now you imagine from your uh, previous PCR experiments, what are the reagents you are adding? You are adding some of the primers. You are also adding DNA polymerase. You are adding different DNTPs, deoxyribonucleotides. So these are the things which were added as a part of the reaction for sequencing. Now, in addition to these deoxyribonucleotides, for sequencing purpose, they added one more reagent, which is dideoxyribonucleotide, which is different. I'll tell you uh, why they did that. Uh, but before that, let's, let's look at the structure of these two. So in the deoxyribonucleotides, uh, whether it is DATP, DCTP, DGTP, or DTTP, in all of them, you will see that you know 3 prime hydroxyl and OH is present here. Whereas in all the dideoxyribonucleotides, this O is missing, so it's only hydrogen is there. OH hydroxyl group is not there. That was one change introduced. Second change here is all these DNTPs are fluorescently labeled. Each one of the A, T, G, uh, C, these are all fluorescently labeled as compared to these ones which are non-fluorescent ones. So by doing this reaction, now they have added DNA polymerase, four DNTPs, four DDNTPs, which are having the fluorescent molecules. So whenever a uh, you know, DD, uh, ATP, or GTP, or CTP, or TTP will go, uh, it will stop the reaction because it does not have the OH group on the side. So it will terminate that particular reaction. And because it is fluorescent labeled, so you can actually try to read that from the fluorescent scanners that what this base pair is, what this is, whether it is A or T or G or C. So the first step was to just add the reaction components, right? Then second part was 
to do a synthesis of the new strand. So if this was the 5 prime to 3 prime of the original DNA template, now uh, because of the primer which you have already provided, uh, a short stretch is started synthesizing from it. And then from here, you can see whenever a C is coming, which is a dideoxy uh, nucleotide, then it is stop that reaction. Whenever a dideoxy G is coming here, so it is actually complementary here, right? If you look at here, this particular uh, stretch of the sequence, when you have A, it is T, A is T, C is G, A is T, and G is C. So whenever this C is coming, which is dideoxy nucleotide, it is stop that reaction. Now, whenever you see another G is coming, that is stop that reaction. So you have many incomplete reactions. You have many incomplete sequences. But what is interesting here, whenever they terminate, there will be some fluorescence color being produced from those base pairs. So this was the second part to incorporate these dideoxy labels and then elongate these strands. And then you are passing each one of these uh, bases, which are labeled now, these sequences from these fluorescent scanners. And then you are reading what are the base pairs, G, A, C, T, G, A, A, G, C. And then you can distinguish them from different colors because you have already labeled each one of these bases as a from different colors. So by using this method, they were able to do the, uh, know the sequence of that particular small uh, DNA piece. And then like that, you have done sequencing for many DNA pieces. And then everything you have to put it together to see which are the complementary regions, which are the overall sequence for that particular genome. This was kind of you know, much more tedious. And uh, although it was very accurate, but it, 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 it takes a lot of time to do this kind of sequencing. But then eventually, uh, this is very, you know, kind of uh, gist of the lot of information here. Sequencing technologies have really matured quite well. So from 2001 onwards, if you think now, in 2017-18, uh, huge progress has been made in the sequencing technologies. So what was kind of in a billion dollar project, which was done in so many years time, now you can do one full genome sequencing probably in two or three days, and maybe in 50 to 60,000 rupees. Just imagine how much progress has been made. And that's only because of people have from the physics background, they brought in a lot of principles of how to read these bases much faster, how to increase the cycle of our scanning, and in which way different type of physical principle could be used to separate these bases, and one could read them much faster. So there are different generations of sequencing technology which has come. The original one was first generation sequencing, either the chain termination or the chemical method. Then we have the second generation sequencing methods, which includes the pyro sequencing and the uh, reversible chain termination. The third generation sequencing is where we now started seeing a lot of engineering and physical principles being involved in sequencing. And that has really accelerated the pace of sequencing technology. One of the latest example is protein nanopore technology, some of the single molecular detection, of uh, FRET technology, and many of these are the you know, latest third generation sequencing methods, which are just aiming to look at the, some of the physical behavior of these bases and how fast and accurately one could read and detect them. So as a result, now our capability to sequence any organism is much faster. So what people used to think about only sequence one Drosophila or one human, now people are thinking, can we sequence you know, maybe 100,000 individuals who are all diabetic, and then look at you know what is happening at their entire genome level in all of that you know uh, one lakh or one million population. So now you will have much robust data because you are looking at much larger population, and you can do it in still much shorter time. So this is one thing that you know you can now sequence the entire organism, entire genome, which much accurately, much faster way, and much more cost reduction has happened as well.